Hello everyone, my name is Pixelriffs and welcome back to the Minecraft Survival Guide. I hope you're all having a good day. In today's episode, we are going to head out into the wilderness to check out a structure that we have not seen yet, but I discovered on a recent live stream. We're going to find a pillager outpost and from there, we're going to try and find a village in which we can start our first pillager raid. This is going to involve a little bit of danger, perhaps not quite as much as I felt like we were in in the deep dark the other day, but I'm going to take the horse out to the savannah biome that is in the distance over in that direction, and I'm going to show you folks what a pillager outpost looks like and the consequences of messing with one. Okay, and here we are in the savannah biome where I've found our pillager outpost. It's over there peeking between the trees. I'm not getting any closer right now because pillagers will swarm around this outpost and attack me if I approach. But the coordinates of this are roughly negative 2500, negative 1200. And I'm saying this because if you're playing in the same world, I actually haven't found a pillager outpost closer than this to the area where we've set up our starter base or to spawn if you've set up your base there. This is really quite far out for a pillager outpost and commonly you will find pillager outposts in any biomes which can contain villages. So you'll find them in savannas, deserts, plains biomes, occasionally in meadow biomes, snow plains biomes and tiger biomes. Naturally they're going to be a little harder to spot in tiger biomes because they're made out of dark oak wood and the tiger biome is going to be surrounding them with trees but here on the savannah biome or in a plains, a meadow or any of the other biomes you're more likely to spot them. They'll stand out from the landscape. But speaking of the landscape, before we go any closer to that pillager outpost, I wanted to show you folks this mountain because when I was exploring on the live stream, we actually stumbled upon this mountain. We kind of came around from the outside and the pillager outpost was almost a secondary concern at that point because this mountain is genuinely really impressive. There is this one sheer rock face which goes down into a dripstone cave. Kind of looks like an alien with this like eye and nose made out of water and then this big open mouth with all of the teeth around. But there's this enormous dripstone quarry that clearly leads down into what I presume is going to be another deep dark biome given the height of this mountain above it. It's a really impressive landscape. And this is the kind of thing that I'm going to be bookmarking for the future of the series because I imagine we can come back and build something really cool and impressive looking here. Although right now, I have absolutely no idea what. Once again, if you want the coordinates for this mountain, they are there on the screen. It's about negative 20. 700 on the x-axis, negative 1300 on the z-axis, and oh boy, is this thing kind of impressive. Anyway, where's my horse? Let's go back to the pillager outpost. So I'm going to tie up my diamond horse a little bit further away from the outpost so we don't risk this horse getting hurt, because once we get in here, the pillagers are going to be, once again, swarming around me with their crossbows and firing at me. And the thing about pillager outposts is, Encountering one of these is not too much different from encountering a pillager patrol. The only difference being, the pillagers around here will be a lot more aggressive. Patrols tend to just sort of wander up to you and stay at a reasonable distance, training their crossbows on you but not attacking, whereas the pillagers around an outpost will attack more immediately. Pillager spawns around an outpost are also a lot more reliable than the chance of stumbling onto a patrol. And if we go into the pillager outpost here, we'll be able to climb to the top of the tower, occasionally fighting pillagers who have spawned inside the structure. But it looks like we don't have any up here. And at the top, we will find a loot chest. Now, this can contain a few different things. There can be armor trims in these pillager outposts, but unfortunately, we do not have one. What we do have, though, is a goat horn, which if we hold it in our hand, we can right click to play and it plays this triumphant little fanfare to say that I have conquered the outpost, I guess. The rest of the loot in here is not all that much to go by. There are bottles of enchanting, which you'll remember we can buy from cleric villagers. There are a few extra pillager banners hanging from around the outpost, but honestly, the true treasure of these things is usually outside. Because out here in these cages, you can often find mobs imprisoned, and typically you will either find an iron golem in here, which you can unleash on the pillagers if you want to cause a little bit of chaos. There you go, he's taking care of the pillagers for me. But alternatively, in some of these cages, you'll find two blue creatures called allays. And allays are really useful mobs. They are utility mobs that if you give them an item, they will fly around, try 
trying to find more of that item and picking them up for you and then returning those items to you as they go. So allays can be really useful. Since we don't have any around this outpost, I don't see any other cages. We'll get into discussing exactly how to use them in a future episode. But honestly, the main advantage of these outposts being here is that pillagers will spawn around them constantly. So you don't have to wait for a patrol to appear in order to encounter a pillager patrol captain. Those are the ones with the banners over the top of their heads. And if we find one of those today, we're going to actually kill them instead of avoiding killing them like we've done in previous episodes. And the reason for that is because we want to get the bad omen effect. It's important to note that pillager spawns are not tied to the structure itself. They are simply tied to the area where the structure spawns. So we could remove this entire tower if we wanted to, and the pillagers would still spawn around this area. So it's actually quite a good idea to keep the towers here as a landmark so that you know where pillager spawns are going to happen. But there's a patrol leader, and let's see if we can get to him before the Iron Golem does. There we go. We got our ourselves that bad omen effect. On Bedrock Edition it'll play a little animation on the screen to let you know you've got bad omen, but on Java Edition the icon simply appears in the top right, and if it's your first time getting bad omen you'll get the voluntary exile advancement, which lets you know to stay away from villages for the time being. Well, we're going to see the consequences of that today because I'm actually going to go out and find a village where we can start a pillager raid. Having explored this area on the live stream, I know that there are several villages around here, so we're going to take our horse we're going to ride out to one of those, and we're going to see if we can trigger a raid. Okay, there is a village down here in the valley, and here I stand on the hilltop, ready to unleash some chaos. Right, well, I think the best thing for us to do once again is going to be to tie up the horse up here so that it is a little bit away from the aforementioned chaos. And with night falling, I'm going to sleep in a bed. I think it's going to be the most sensible thing to do to make sure we can do this during the day because the addition of night spawning mobs would be a bit of a chaotic addition to the raid. And we're going to try and do this as sensibly as possible. Now, as soon as we run into the radius of this village, as soon as we get within a certain distance of any villagers at workstations and beds and that kind of thing, the raid is going to begin. So we want to quickly do a couple of things. If there is a village bell somewhere inside here, we want to ring it. That will encourage the villagers to return to their homes. And it looks like in the center there where the village well is, there is a bell right there. Once the villagers have returned to their homes, we're going to use a couple of blocks to block them in because the conditions of a raid starting are simply walking into an active village where there are villagers and their points of interest, workstations and beds. So in theory, I could start a pillager raid right next to my home where I have a couple of villagers just working in little stalls, but the pillagers will start to come in in waves and they will bring reinforcements in the form of other mobs. And the only way to win a pillager raid is to destroy each of those waves entirely. The way you can lose a pillager raid is if every villager in the village is eliminated, or alternatively if all of their points of interest are eliminated, but the pillagers are mostly going to be concerned with attacking the villagers. So we're going to head into the center of this village, I'm going to ring that bell, and we're going to try and block any villagers in their homes to make sure that they are safe from pillagers trying to knock down the door. Now this village has some pretty interesting terrain going on here, so it looks like we should have our work cut out for us, but let me ring the bell in the center. That should hopefully encourage any villagers who are around to return to their homes. And yep, you can see them scrambling around. A couple of them are ringing the bell themselves because they know a raid is on the way. And they have a little bit of trouble getting into their homes occasionally, but there we go. We've got at least one of them. Now you'll notice a group of pillagers has spawned on the hillside over there, and they will be making their way down into the village to attack the villagers. I blocked a couple of villagers inside of their homes, and as long as we have at least two, we could always return the population to maximum by breeding up some villagers, making sure they have food and beds and that kind of thing. But the first wave is upon us. You'll notice the raid bar appears at the top of the screen, and that will diminish every time a pillager is killed in this case. So we just have to make sure that we take care of all of these pillagers. And we have one raider remaining who is just still up there on the hillside. At this point, I will point out that the difficulty that we're playing at is going to make a difference to the intensity 
of these raids. So in this case, I'm still playing on normal difficulty since we created the world on normal, and I have not adjusted that. If you play on easy difficulty, you're only likely to encounter three waves of a raid before it completes. Here on normal difficulty, there will be five waves of the raid, and on hard difficulty, you will get seven, plus an additional wave of the raid for each level of the bad omen effect that you had when you entered the village. And in this case, we only killed one pillager captain before entering the village, so we only had the first level of Bad Omen. It looks like the villagers are now milling around inside the village. They're ringing the bell once again, and hopefully a couple more of them should return to their houses because once that raid bar fills up, the second wave will arrive. And in this case, it sounded like the pillager horn sounded from over this hill. Yes, there we go. And this guy is a little different to anybody we've encountered before. These are Vindicators. They are axe-wielding illagers. They will look a little bit different. They will not attack you from range. They will simply rush at you and attack you with an iron axe. And they can hit pretty hard, especially especially on harder difficulties. So it's important that we take them out as swiftly as possible. One of them was carrying the pillager captain's banner there, but it looks like we have dealt with him nice and easily, and we should be able to take out the remainder of the crossbow firing pillagers. Okay, that is wave number two all done and dusted. I really hope these villagers find their way into a house soon, because they're just running around the village center right now. There is a vacant house right here, buddy. Come over here and, and get in the house. Okay, wave three of the raid has spawned over here, and this is brought with it a couple of other mobs which are potentially going to be very difficult to handle. This giant lumbering beast over here is a Ravager and these things can charge at you and deal a lot of damage, even more so than the Vindicators with their axes. So to deal with these I recommend getting on top of a building if you can and sniping at it from the top of the building where it won't be able to harm you unless in this case it can pathfind over a tree. So I'll have to give it the jukes and hope that that Iron Golem is able to help take care of some of the other critters who have spawned as part of this raid. Where's our Ravager gone? Did I take him down with that arrow? Yes, it looks like I did. Okay, the saddle on the ground here is a pretty sure sign that the Ravager has perished. And thankfully, the village's Iron Golem is helping me defend. Last of all, a witch has arrived with the rest of the raid. Witches will effectively act as support units to the pillagers, throwing potions that heal them or help them regenerate their health. But in this case, the witch isn't going to be able to do a great deal against this Iron Golem. So unless it's cornered, it's not really going to do a whole bunch. There we go. The witch was taken down, dropped a bunch of stuff actually, that's kind of nice, and now we can continue with wave four of the raid. Pay attention to which direction the horn sounds from, because that's the direction from which the next wave of the raid is going to arrive, and it looks like this one has started up on the hillside. No ravages this time, but a bunch of witches and a couple of vindicators, it looks like. So let's hop up here and see if we can snipe a couple of the pillagers and the witches from range. Don't worry about taking out the pillagers with banners during the course of the raid. They will not add to the bad omen effect that you had at the start of the raid since the raid is already in action. And after having taken down all those crossbowmen, the only two left are these witches who will throw poison potions at you. So if you get hit with one of those, it's probably a good idea to back off a little bit. Make sure you don't end up getting hit with the potion of harming. And if you need to, throw down a bed and set your spawn point somewhere. This witch has now infected me with poison and slowness, but we are getting rid of the witch to begin the final wave of the raid. At least this should be the final wave. I'm making sure to keep my health up because I still have a bunch of that poison effect. And this last wave should come in with a mob we have not seen before. The guy who is sprinting around over there and currently taking a bunch of full damage is an evoker. And he will spawn in these flying mobs called vexes. Thankfully, we have taken those down relatively quickly and they were more concerned about the iron golem than they were with me. So I'm once again standing up here on the hilltop trying to defend these villagers. There's a couple in the village down there who are still taking a little bit of damage, although the Vindicators seem to be getting stuck in the water streams over there, which is kind of great, actually. The thing I'm most concerned about is that there was a pillager riding a Ravager who came down from the hillside, and I've lost track of exactly where that one is, so I am gonna keep my wits about me, or try to at least, as I make my way down into the village to deal with these Vindicators. And we'll deal with them from range, because they are melee attackers, and once one of them drops one of those captain's banners, the others will actually swarm towards it, so that can be something you can use to your advantage when dealing with these guys. There we go, this pillager stopped harassing the nitwit and shifted his focus to me, and now we should only have to deal with maybe a couple of other support units. Maybe there's a Ravager still around somewhere. I'm wondering if any of them fell off the cliff and down into this little gully, which it looks like they might not be able to escape at this stage. Oh, it looks like the Ravager is up here, and they seem to be harassing the inhabitants of this house on the hillside. Well, let's see if we can 
take out the Ravager quickly now. We should be able to do a couple of decent bow shots, but it seems like we also hit the Pillager. Now, let's see if we can get the Ravager to walk into this water stream. Yep, there we go. That slowed him down a little bit. Should be able to deal a couple of up-close shots. Brilliant. Yeah, thankfully, the Ravagers aren't equipped with Depth Strider boots like I am, so they have a harder time making their way through water streams. This Witch should be the final mob we have to deal with in the raid, and that bar is all empty and we get that victory fanfare we get hero of the village which is not just a fancy advancement it's also a status effect the villagers are setting off fireworks in celebration of our victory how fantastic now let me leap up to the bed up here in this tree so we can sleep for the night and avoid any zombies or anything spawning and we'll talk about what hero of the village does yeah, even in the daytime we can see those fireworks. That's awesome. Now let's take a look at what villagers we have in this village because the professions here are going to play a role. And before we forget, we should absolutely pick up this. This is something that the evokers drop. So in this case, we only found one evoker spawning as part of that wave of the raid. But these Totems of Undying are something I've mentioned very briefly in other episodes. If one of these is held in your hand when you take fatal damage, the Totem will absorb the death for you. It will effectively destroy the Totem, but you'll get a very brief burst of regeneration and fire resistance, which should hopefully help you to counter whatever it is that has just dealt the fatal damage to you, and it effectively saves you from dying. Which is not the most important thing when you're playing in regular survival but in a hardcore playthrough in which you only have one life and if you die you can't respawn then totems of undying can be incredibly helpful items anyway with hero of the village we can walk up to any of these villagers and you'll notice they're giving us some pretty decent discounts or at least the kind of discounts you could expect to get after trading with a few villagers and building up some gossip alas our iron golem did not survive the night so we can pick up these iron ingots as well as a tribute to them and it seems like this village is mostly populated with leather the workers so I'm probably going to go around find a couple of those cauldrons and destroy them in the hopes of getting a farmer villager there's even a few more emeralds in this chest that I might take but I'm going to pop in some of the useless stuff from the raid we're going to leave the banners here since they aren't really used for a great deal and this is the house where the leather workers have their cauldrons and they've already started throwing me a couple of things I'm going to return to the center of the village here throw down a crafting table and start making a composter which I should be able to make out of any slabs I've got lying around there we go let's throw down one of these and see if we can get a couple of trades in with a farmer especially since there are so many hay bales around here this guy has now adopted the farmer profession and you'll notice with this hero of the village effect we should have that for about 40 minutes after clearing a normal difficulty raid the villagers will actually throw you items related to their profession it'll usually be fairly basic items but this farmer is potentially going to throw us a couple of crops like wheat or carrots or something the leather workers inside of there threw me a piece of leather which is how come i now have one of those in my inventory oh and this guy's thrown me a cookie oh what a legend okay i'm gonna grab that and probably eat that because i <laughs> don't know if we've really covered cookies in this series yet maybe when we talked about cocoa beans either way this guy is also offering me some discounts although in this case it's on potatoes so if we want to get a decent discount discount for wheat we'll have to there we go reset his trades a couple of times and here he's asking for 14 wheat per emerald so we can easily lock in that trade and for the duration of this hero of the village effect he's going to give us a pretty decent discount Oh, and he threw me some bread there as well, although I think he immediately picked it up again when I couldn't pick it up, <laughs> because, of course, villagers do use bread as one of the items for their own food. Now, if we trade a little bit more with this guy, we should be able to get him to the next level, and we can start using some of the other trades he's got. We can buy some pumpkin pie off of him. We can trade him some pumpkins. And part of the reason I wanted to point out Hero of the Village at this stage in the series is because I've just updated to the latest version of Minecraft, 1.20.2. And as of this update, Zombify and curing a villager multiple times no longer stacks discounts in the way that it used to and I don't think this was ever really a thing on bedrock edition but it's been something we have used on Java edition for quite a while to sort of exploit the trading system and get the best value for our emeralds as of the 1.20.2 update you can only get discounts by zombifying and curing a villager once or if it's a zombie villager that you cured to begin with no further zombification and curing is going to lead to any further discounts so hero of the 
village is actually now a really useful effect because it can stack up with the zombification discount and the gossip discounts that you get from trading with villagers and having a good reputation and that will give you even steeper discounts on some of the stuff they're trading leading to you being able to trade a very small amount of wheat for emeralds with a farmer villager. One of the things we're going to do in future is to set up a controlled environment for us to take on and defeat these pillager raids because that will allow us to stack up these hero of the village discounts and get an even steeper discount on any trades that we happen to have. And it's not just this village that will be grateful to you for saving them either. If you walk into another village with this hero of the village effect, it will be quite possible to get free items and discounts on trades from those villages as well. And now having saved the day, having defended this village from a crisis that I actually kind of caused by walking in with bad omen, we're going to head on home and see if we can use these hero of the village discounts on villages that we've already traded with. All right, back here at our little settlement, I'm going to tie the horse back up to the post over here. Thank you very much, horse. <laughs> An excellent taxi service. And now if we head back over to our villagers who we've had stationed outside of here for a little while, there we go. We've got our Fletcher right here. We have Regis the Farmer over here. We should find that with 25 minutes of Hero of the Village left, we should get some pretty decent discounts from these folks. Now, of course, Regis doesn't have a wheat trade right now, which is going to be a problem for me, so I'm probably going to break and replace this composter, because that should hopefully refresh Regis's trades, although it looks like he's not in the mood to take on this fresh job quite yet. Let's take a look at how many sticks we can sell, and this is a significant discount from what we were able to trade before. 18 sticks for an emerald, that's close to getting four emeralds out of a full stack of sticks, which is really not bad. Remember that each of these villages were ones we had cured from zombie villages that we found wandering around here on the plains. So we are getting the zombification discount stacked up with the hero of the village discount. And it seems like it's going to take Regis a second or two here to remember that he is a farmer. So we're going to leave him to ponder that for a little while. There we go, looks like he's donned the hat of the farmer now. And of course, he's got exactly the same traits. Well, we haven't traded with him yet, so those should not be locked in and it should be possible for us to simply swap the composter over and hopefully get some new trades from him. Let's drop off some of the other stuff that we got from that battle in our storage system. A lot of it is stuff that I'm not automatically storing, so I'll have to throw some of this stuff in here manually. But while I have the opportunity, I'm definitely going to take some of these spruce logs, break them down into sticks, and trade those with our Fletcher while we still got this incredible discount. We're getting even less now. We're getting 17 sticks per emerald, thanks to the fact that I have traded with this villager a few times now, and he's gotten very friendly with us, so that's that's really, really good. Although, of course, every trade is going to only unlock a couple of times per day. So we're still kind of on the clock here. We need to use our time effectively. We need to sleep as soon as it gets to nighttime. And that way, we should be able to take full advantage of this hero of the village discount. In the meantime, Regis still hasn't given me a wheat trade. So I'm considering taking the carrot or potato trades when they show up and just harvesting a bunch from my farms over there. Now, believe it or not, this is not the best discount we could possibly get from the these villagers because if you end up walking into a village with multiple levels of bad omen, let's say I killed three pillager captains before I walked into the village, I completed the raid and the additional bonus waves of the raid and I ended up with hero of the village three. Additional levels of hero of the village will stack up the discounts that we get from these trades. Look at that, he's trading us nine wheat for an emerald. That's a really solid price for the wheat trade. And to be honest, it could be a really good time to get rid of our beets. Plus he's trading us a pumpkin for an emerald and we have plenty of pumpkins. Yeah, let's harvest a bunch of the beets and pumpkins that we have growing over here and let's do some trades with Regis while we can. Six beet root per emerald is still a pretty good deal. We're still getting 10 emeralds out of that. And I'm sure I can get a little bit more wheat from my wheat farm over there as well. But with the sun rising over the house, we can now trade with the Fletcher again. And while that's gone back up to 18 now, we should be able to get a decent amount of goods out of this. With Hero of the Village, these villagers might also try to throw us some of the stuff that they produce. For example, the farmer, as we saw earlier, will throw you some bread or some cookies. The Fletcher will actually throw you arrows, and those can occasionally be the potion-tipped arrows that appear at the bottom of their list of trades. And in this case, we're actually getting a pretty significant discount on a lot of the other trades here as well. Five string for an emerald is a really good trade considering we just set up an automatic passive string farm, so we could maybe take advantage of that if I want to dump off some of the extra string. Which, yeah, we have in large enough quantities that I feel okay sacrificing a few stacks. And there go all of the pumpkins as well. We'll see if the farmer ends up trading us some 
melons. Yes, there he does. Okay, great. So we can include the melons in this as well. And we brought back a handful of emeralds from that initial raid village, along with a couple that the Vindicators dropped when we killed them. But even then, we've managed to acquire two stacks of emeralds in a handful of minutes, which is really not too bad. Not to mention how much additional experience we end up accumulating from trading with these villages. So I'd say all in all, that's been a pretty resounding success. But there is, of course, more to this, because... As I mentioned, if you end up doing those raids on hard difficulties, you end up with two additional waves of enemies, and that includes more evokers and vindicators. At one point, you even find an evoker riding a ravager, so that can be quite a difficult challenge to take on, and all of the enemies are going to hit even harder. But that leaves you with more opportunities to acquire Totems of Undying, which can really save your bacon in the trickier areas of the world. And Totems of Undying might also be essential if you want to take on the challenge of fighting a Warden in hand-to-hand -hand combat. So in future, we will do a lot more with Pillager Raids and this Hero of the Village effect. But right now, I'm just going to stick around and do a little bit of trading with my two villagers here at the starter area. And that's where we're going to leave this episode of the Minecraft Survival Guide. Folks, I hope you've enjoyed this look at Pillager Raids, the Pillager Outposts, Bad Omen, and Hero of the Village. Good luck if you want to attempt Pillager Raids in your own world. Thank you so much for watching. My name has been Pixel Riffs. Don't forget to leave a like on this video if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you want to see more, and I'll see you folks soon. Take care. Bye for now.